Another issue that requires addressing is the decision of the first deputy speaker to upend my admission of the motion and rule that the motion should not have been admitted in the first place. Honorable members, it is interesting to note that this is the second time the first deputy speaker has taken the chair and has made a ruling which, in fact, was to overrule a position I had earlier on established before the House. In fact, the second deputy speaker was, the first deputy speaker was in my office. And what I'm telling you today, I told him before he left to the airport. The first deputy speaker has contended, and rightfully so, on several occasions, that he is not the speaker. I have also, on several occasions, alluded to various areas of parliamentary practice, where when the speaker is in the chair, makes a ruling another presiding officer may not overturn that ruling. My former statement on the matters arising from the budget and captured in paragraph 46 read as follows, and I quote, Honorable members, although outstanding orders are silent on this, Many standard orders and rules from several sister parliaments provide persuasive rules who suggest that when deputy speakers or acting speakers are in the chair, whatever happens in the House is that officer's responsibility. And the speaker cannot be called upon to overrule it. Similarly, the reverse is also the case, that when a speaker is in the chair, whatever happens in the house is the speaker's responsibility, and the deputy speaker or acting speaker cannot be called upon to overrule it, unquote. That was what I read to the house that day. The penchant of the first deputy speaker to overrule my rulings is to say the least, unconstitutional, illegal, and offensive. Be that as it may, I shall not be taking any steps to overrule the decision of the first deputy speaker to dismiss the motion as moved by the honorable ranking member of the finance committee. The deputy speakers and I would deliberate on how to present a more coherent and uniform structure in respect of rulings so that the House is guided at all times during deliberations. Our standing orders provide the procedure for challenging the rulings of the Chair, and those agree by the rulings may take the necessary steps. The proposals of the private member's motion may thus be guided by the standing orders of the House to right the wrong. I hope this is understood. And I repeat, I hope this statement provides a much needed clarity on the matters of dispute that arose yesterday. And I hope we can forge ahead for the common good of the people who have entrusted us with leadership and a mandate to better their lives. The standing orders will guide those who brought the motion and the proper thing will be done for the House to consider the motion. Please, 
It's not only you, members of parliament, who discuss national matters with me. Your ministers, your presidents, traditional leaders and the rest, we do them together. I can tell you that the country is not happy with our performance. We have to up our game. As a person of ultimate responsibility, I retreat. I will do so with the powers and authority that has been conferred on me by the Constitution and the laws of this country. I mean what I say. I want to thank you all for your attention. Please be focused on what we are here to do. If you are not here and you haven't heard, ask. Don't just jump in, misquote people and say anything. The responsibility for admission of motions is that of the speaker and the speaker alone. This is enough for today. I'll come back tomorrow.